This coming Sunday is the uh, day of Pentecost, the uh, 50th day after Easter and the uh, day of the sending of the Holy Spirit. And we have some very inspiring uh, scripture passages to look at for that. I'm going to be spending most of the time on Acts chapter 2, the account of the sending of the Holy Spirit in that book, and then spend a little bit of time in the psalm and the uh, uh, second reading in gospel looking at what the Holy Spirit does. First, let's look at the first reading from Acts chapter 2. It starts out, When the day of Pentecost had come, the apostles were all gathered together in one place. Uh, let's take a look at a map here. Um, in my opinion, um, very, I'm assuming that they were gathered together in the upper room, the same place as where they had had the Last Supper with Jesus. And they were there when they received the Holy Spirit, the tongues of fire, and so on. And then they went to the temple area. And so they would, there's a, we're going to be seeing pictures of the steps on the south side. And I think that's where they were speaking and where the people were hearing them speak, each in their own native language. Now, Pentecost is uh, one of the great holidays of the church. But Pentecost is also a Jewish holiday, the holiday of Shavuot the Feast of Weeks. The holiday of Shavuot commemorated the wheat harvest in Israel as well as the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. In other words, just like at Passover time, so Shavuot would be a time where there'd be lots and lots of pilgrims in Jerusalem. Another example of God's perfect timing. He gave the uh, Holy Spirit on a day when they commemorated the giving of the first fruits and also the giving of the law at a time where people from all over the Mediterranean world would have been there in Jerusalem. Another example of God's perfect timing. Now let's think a little bit about that concept. Oh, let me just go back to Shavuot for a second. Uh, first time I went to Israel was with a friend in 1980. Uh, we kind of did our own thing, traveled on local transportation and did quite a bit of hitchhiking in the West Bank, which I would not do today. But we arrived there on Shavuot and didn't know that. We knew that the buses didn't run from Friday at sundown till Saturday at sundown. We arrived at Tel Aviv Airport, Ben Gurion, went out looking for a bus to take the bus to Jerusalem and no buses. Why are there no buses? It's Shavuot. Well, what's Shavuot? You know, so that was the first time I really became familiar with that. So uh, no Israeli buses, so we had to take a, uh, a Palestinian sharut, which is a, a taxi that would go along on a specific route for a higher price than the, the, um, than the bus. But let's think about that concept of the gather together in one place. Was this, and I think it was, was this the one place where the disciples were all together, the same place where they had had the Last Supper with Jesus. I feeling that was such a special time. You know, John devotes many chapters to that. And so this was such a special time. They remember that special time with Jesus in that special place. And so I have a feeling that's where they continue to gather. Was that also the same place where Easter Sunday evening and the following East, uh, Sunday Jesus appeared to them after the resurrection? Remember the first time Thomas was not there, the second time he was. Was this the same place where Acts 1.14 describes them as being constantly devoted to prayer between the ascension on the 40th day and Pentecost on the 50th day? Was that the place where they also gathered for constant prayer? What's interesting in that Acts 1.14 verse that I mentioned is that Mary and Jesus' brothers are mentioned. This is the last time in the Bible that Mary is mentioned, but it does say that Jesus' brothers had been there. Do you remember how his brothers opposed him during his earthly ministry? But he appeared to the brother James afterwards, who became a believer and then a leader of the church in Jerusalem and the author of the book of James. So I think it's significant that Jesus' brothers had come to faith in Jesus and now were a part of that gathering. It was also this the same place where they felt they needed to choose a successor to Judas and so they chose Matthias. Was this that special place that they would keep on going back to? And so I asked the question, is there a place where you have met God and that you like to go back to? Because when you go back to that special place, you feel especially close to God. Do you have a special place 
and where for you is that special place. Verse 2, suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, divided tongues as a fire appeared on them, and rested on top of each one of them, and they began to speak in other languages as the uh, Spirit gave them ability. Let's think about that concept of the rush of a violent wind. Several of the disciples had been fishermen, and they were very familiar with the experience of the rush of a violent wind. Sea of Galilee is about 600 feet below sea level. You would have the winds coming off the desert or off the Mediterranean, rushing down the canyons, intensifying as they rushed to the canyons, and all of a sudden you had this storm. And so they were very familiar with the rush of a violent wind, which would have been their greatest cause of fear. You know, we have accounts in the Bible of their getting caught in these storms. So they very much knew what the rush of a violent wind was like. And so I think uh, that's interesting that this would have been something that they had experienced, and now they were experiencing something like similar to what they had experienced on the Sea of Galilee. And so I ask for you, sometimes the Spirit appears like a dove. At the baptism of Jesus, remember the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. We think of a dove as gentle, a gentle uh, uh, um, entreating us to come to faith in Jesus. And so when for you has the Holy Spirit come and been like a dove? Remember to, uh, uh, to Elijah, God appeared not in the earthquake, wind, or fire, but instead in the sound of sheer silence in a still small voice. When has the Spirit come to you like a dove? When has the Holy Spirit been for you like fire? Often in the Bible, fire is the image of, of, uh, of purifying, a purifying fire, purifying metal. When has the Holy Spirit's presence been a purifying, sanctifying experience for you, making you more holy and making you desire to let go of sin? And when has the Holy Spirit been for you like the rush of a violent wind? Powerful, powerful. So, I think at that point, they then go from the upper room to the southern steps of the temple. And let's look at uh, what that would be like. So here is the Temple Mount. Remember, Herod the Great had uh, put up this retaining wall so that he would be able to be able to greatly expand this whole area. Uh, the retaining wall, the temple itself would be here, but then there would be steps leading up to these entrances. And so uh, I have a feeling that this is where the disciples went, speaking in uh, languages that were able to be understood by uh, people from many different areas. Here is what that looks like today, the southern end of the retaining wall. You can see um, entrances here that have been clogged up, and then you can see the remains of those steps with some of the steps recreated. So tour groups can come and take their picture and hear the talk from their group leader and so on. So this, I have a feeling, is the place where they gathered the southern end of the retaining wall. Now, at this particular time, verse 5, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. There were not only those that were visiting Jerusalem because of Shavuot, the very important holiday, but they were living in Jerusalem from many different areas. And so at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one of them heard the apostles speaking in their own native language. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? Do you remember Peter had been recognized by the girl on the night of Jesus' betrayal as a Galilean because of his accent? Well, we can tell by their accent that they're Galileans. Kind of like being able to tell when someone is from, you know, Wisconsin or Minnesota or whatever, the accent. They give themselves away. They're Galileans. And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? I've shared on a number of occasions that speaking in tongues is mentioned in Acts and in 1 Corinthians. And I believe that they were not the same. In 1 Corinthians, speaking in tongues is an act of worship. The tongues are unknown languages. The tongues is a prayer, intimate prayer experience. 
For example, Paul says in the 14th chapter, if it's a public setting and someone wants to speak in tongues, well, there needs to be an interpreter. And if there's not someone to interpret that the whole, so that the whole body, the whole church can benefit, then they need to speak to do it privately and in silence. It was an unknown languages and for the purpose of worship. In the book of Acts, speaking in tongues is known languages for the purpose of outreach. In other words, as people heard the gospel in their own native language, then they knew that the gospel was also for them. Do you remember how in Acts 11, which was the first reading not too many weeks ago, where Peter and some of the uh, fellow Christians went to Cornelius' house, the Gentile Christians speak in tongues, and Peter says, wow, they have received the same gift as we did when we, you know, on the day of Pentecost. And so how can we keep them from being baptized? Speaking in tongues in that instance was God's, another way of God saying, I have included these people also within the people whom I love. Now, one person said, when I hear the gospel in English, this is a person who's, for whom English is not his native language. When I hear the gospel in English, it speaks to my head. But when I hear the gospel in my native language, it speaks to my heart. I know that it's also for me. Uh, the, uh, I came out to California in, in uh, 1969 at the age of 21 to go to seminary. And that was really the first time that um, I, I, I had a number of classmates who were non-Caucasian. And many of them had English as not their first language. And that was kind of a whole new experience for me, coming from the Midwest, where 99% where, where of the people, at least, were, were, were Caucasian. So here I was in a multicultural setting for the first time, and it was a very different experience. And I remember in one class where we as students would take turns opening in prayer. And I remember a classmate from Japan. And when he prayed, he prayed in Japanese. And it was very powerful the way that the professor uh, mentioned that for so many people, even though they'll speak in English because they're in an English-speaking country, when they pray, they will pray in their native language. That is the, lang the heart language. When I hear the gospel in my heart language, I know that it is also for me. We had a large Pakistani community that was part of the congregation. I was pastor of in Southern California. <clears throat> and uh, we would host the, the annual Christmas gathering for the Indo-Pakistani congregations of Southern California. And they would, they would tell the Christmas story in Urdu. And it was always so powerful for me to hear the angels say to the shepherds or sing to the shepherds, I bring you good news of great joy for all people and to hear that sung in Urdu, to hear that sung in another language. When I hear it in my own native language, I know that it is also for me. Beginning with now verse 9, they say, We are from all these different places, Parthians, Medes, Edom, Elamites. Let's look at this map of where all these different places are, Mesopotamia, Pontus, and so on. In other words, people had come from all of these different areas, this, uh, this would be the Parthians over here, Regnum, the kingdom of, of the Parthians, and so on. Uh, I call this a lector's worst nightmare. This is, of all passages, the one that lectors don't want to do because how do I pronounce all of, those all of these words? They were amazed. They were amazed and perplexed. What does this mean? But others sneered and said, no, they're just filled with new wine. That would be cheap wine. They're, they're drunk on, on cheap wine. So I asked the question, have you ever known people to sneer at and to dismiss the wonderful works of God? God does something really wonderful, but have you known people to just dismiss it and sneer at it? Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. I believe that one of the strongest evidences, as I write, for the reliability of the biblical account of the resurrection of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, given 50 days after Easter, is the tremendous change that took place in Peter from the night of his denying Jesus to the day of Pentecost when he's boldly proclaiming Jesus. How could this change have taken place if the resurrection and the sending of the Spirit hadn't happened? 
and the disciples knew that the whole thing was just a hoax. What does he say? Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. They are not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. You know, it would really be bad to be drunk already at nine o'clock in the morning. Instead, this is what the prophet Joel had said around uh, 800 years before. In the last days, God declares, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. In the Old Testament, the spirit was given to individual people for a particular task, such as the spirit was, uh, came upon Saul when he was king, and then it was taken away from Saul. It was placed upon David. After David sinned with Bathsheba in Psalm 51, he says, Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Um, or the Holy Spirit was given to people who would be doing special work in the building of the tabernacle. The Spirit was not given to all people as, a, as an ongoing gift, but instead to certain people for a particular purpose. But God says that in the last days I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Uh, something is true from Pentecost on that was not true before. The Spirit given to all people uh, who believe in Christ and also uh, the Spirit now giving the gifts that Jesus obtained through his death and resurrection. Uh, on your sons and daughters, your young men shall see visions, your old men dream dreams, even upon my slaves, men and women. Those days I'll pour out my Holy Spirit. You'll see how inclusive that is, young and old, male and female, free and slave. And so, young men see visions, old men dream dreams. I ask the question, what visions do you see? What dreams do you dream? When it says old men dream dreams, that means that even we who are older than 70 uh, need to be having dreams and goals. Uh, there are many times I've taught this passage to a group that included a number of older people. When I've been teaching this passage, I've asked them, what is your vision? What is your dream? What is your goal? What are your goals? And it's really, it's been sad how many have responded, I don't have a vision. I don't have a dream. I don't have any goals anymore. And yet this says, the Bible is saying that the Holy Spirit enables even older people to dream dreams. May we also dream dreams, have goals, and see visions even in our senior years. Powerful passage. Now let's look at the psalm. I, I, I've always liked this psalm. Um, I like what it says about creation. Uh, psalm 104, we see that as the spirit at the source of life. How manifold are your works, O Lord. You know, God, you have done so much. In wisdom, you've made them all. The earth is full of all your creatures. I go to the zoo and I think, God must have an incredible sense of humor and God must absolutely love variety. Look at all the different animals he's made. Look at all the plants he's made. Look at all the different people he has made. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide, with its swarms too many to number, living things both small and great. Remember a number of years ago, Terry and I went to the, uh, the aquarium at Monterey, California, and, and, something, and, 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 and one of the signs there said something I had never thought of, because I had always seen an aquarium where, where fish are close to coral or they're close to land. And, and so I figure, well, fish are always kind of swimming next to coral and land and, and seaweed and, and so on like that. But it had a, a tank of, that you could see from the side of, of fish that just constantly swim. And they said there are, like the majority of the world's fish, never see land. All they do is swim. And I thought, I, I'd never thought of that. You know, with the, the Pacific and so on being so huge, all of the fish, with the majority of them never seeing land, swarms too many to number, living things both great and small. There go the ships to and fro, and the Leviathan, which you made for the sport of it. I, I love that verse, Leviathan. That's been, was the, some think the Leviathan is the crocodile. Some think the Leviathan might have been some kind of sea monster or whatever. Well, I like that. The Leviathan you made for the sport of it. 
Do you remember the Monty Python film and now for something completely different? Well, I, I see God saying, today I'm going to make something completely different. I'm going to make a Leviathan. God made a Leviathan just because that would be interesting and that's something completely different. God loves variety. It's incredible what he's done. All of them look to you to give them their food in due season. They know who gives them their food and how dependent upon food they are. You give it to them, they gather it, you open your hand, they're filled with good things. When you hide your face, they're terrified. When you take away their breath, they die. You send forth a spirit and are created, and so you renew the face of the earth. The spirit as the source of life, physically and spiritually. And then what are some of the other things that the Holy Spirit does? And I just want to talk about three of them, uh, which are contained within our second reading, as well as our gospel for this coming Sunday. First, the Holy Spirit leads us. Romans 8, 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God, are children of God, when have you experienced the Spirit leading you? How have you sensed the Spirit leading you? I think of the temptation account in the Gospels. The Spirit led Jesus or drove Jesus into the wilderness. That tells me that the Spirit will not always just lead us into a pleasant place. But how is the Spirit leading you? And where is the Spirit leading you right now? The Spirit enables us to call God Father. Romans 8, 15 to 16. When we cry, Abba, Father. Now, Abba was not originally a Swedish rock group, you know, dancing queen, da 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 da, and so on. Abba was originally not a Swedish rock group. Rather, Abba was the term that the, uh, the uh, Arab, Aramaic speaking child would call their father, Abba, Father. Uh, we probably recognize um, the Hebrew Ab, Ab Ram, Father of Nations, so Abba was like daddy. When we call God Father, it is the Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit enables us to call God Father. And what does it mean to you to be able to know God as Father, come to Him as Father, and to call Him Father? And then the Spirit advocates for us and teaches us. Jesus said, I will send the... When I, I will, the John 14 was just... A, was the night of the betrayal, and so this is uh, 40 days before the ascension. But you know, the day will come when Jesus will ascend into heaven and then send the Holy Spirit, who will be the advocate, advocate. Another term is paraclete, to call alongside of. The Holy Spirit is an advocate, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything, and will remind you of all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit is advocate, and the Holy Spirit is teacher. How is the Spirit advocating for you? And what right now is the Holy Spirit teaching you? And so let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that on the day of Pentecost, you sent the Holy Spirit, and people were able to hear the gospel message, each one in their own native language, and hearing it in their native tongue, that they knew that it was also for them. We thank you for the times when the Spirit comes to us like a dove, gentle, calling us. When the Spirit comes to us like fire, purifying us and making us more holy. And we thank you for the times when the Spirit comes like the rush of a violent wind, the strength. We pray that we will not be like those that dismissed your wondrous works, but instead will value what you have done. We thank you that you... Give the Holy Spirit that enables us to see visions, dream dreams, and have goals. We pray for anyone right now that doesn't have a vision, a dream, or a goal. We pray that you will give them that gift. We thank you for your wonderful, wonderful works. We thank you for the way in which the Spirit leads us, enables us to call you Father, advocates for us, and teaches us. In your name we pray. Amen.